It's been an interesting week. Um, I've learned that uh, this is not just about the science, but this is a diplomatic process. And the governments have given us some constructive feedback, but they have also given us a hard time on some of the topics. We've gotten quite some pushback on some bullets that they didn't really like, not because they weren't factually correct, but because they were disturbing. Uh, uh, and that was a challenge. But we, in the end, we got the report accepted, and we got each and every statement in there that we had wanted to put in. So I'm pleased with the week. Well, towards the end of the report, actually it's the last section we're talking about sort of the long-term impacts of climate change and irreversibility and the relationships between the total carbon emitted and the temperature change. Uh, we show in the last figure a very simple relationship between the total emitted CO2 and temperature, which is basically telling you that each ton that you emit to the atmosphere, each ton of CO2, is going to cause about the same amount of climate change, and it is nearly irreversible. And it doesn't matter where you emit that CO2 and when, so you could emit it today or in 20 years from now, it's going to cause about the same amount of climate change and probably damage as well. And that is a factually correct statement. It's a purely physical aspect, but obviously that has a tremendous implication on policy because you could infer from that some sort of responsibility uh, for the countries for both past and future emissions. And some countries were pleased with that. Um, some European countries were found that a very useful concept to move along in the climate negotiations. And some other countries obviously didn't like it, and they were really pushing hard to uh, sort of weaken the statements, or they actually tried to get rid of them. Um, not because they're wrong, but they were basically saying, this is not relevant and I can't explain this to my minister. That is sort of the level of arguments that you get. And it took us about six hours, I think, to go through four um, of these statements. But uh, basically, after a whole night, we, we were there. I'm happy with the report, as I said, because all the statements are still there. Some of them are somewhat obscure, and if you read them in hindsight, you, you might say, well, what they, were they thinking? And they're obscure because some of the countries had particular interests and they were trying to add some language to accommodate. So sometimes these statements get pretty long and they may have a footnote or two footnotes and, and three other notes uh, to satisfy all the countries because it's, it's, a, it's a process where all the governments have to agree. So you have 100 countries, um, probably 300 government representatives and 50 scientists and each and every one of them have to agree to each and every word. So if one of them objects, you don't move forward. And, and sometimes there is confrontation, but there is usually no way of moving forward except by finding consensus. And that takes a long time, and sometimes it takes compromises. Um, but in the end, you get there, usually during the night, when time is getting uh, precious and people are getting tired, and some people are leaving, then suddenly things move forward. And that's why usually you end up with the report adopted about an hour before the press conference starts. That's uh, sort of normal. Well, there's clearly some positions that are quite obvious. So some of the European countries are pushing for relatively strong statements. And I should be precise, they are not trying to change the science. Uh, none of the countries has ever sort of questioned the number that we came up with. But they're trying to put certain things more up front or further down, or maybe they would argue that this is less relevant and they would argue to put it in a footnote to sort of give it less weight. And then there are, so as I said, some countries are sort of pushing for clearer statements 
and stronger statements, and other countries uh, are trying to sort of weaken things and, and obscure things a bit. And it's obvious that the countries with high emissions, uh, China, Brazil uh, in particular, uh, they have been very difficult this week, but in the end, uh, I must say I'm happy that they also agreed to all of these sentences. So um, uh, I think it's actually quite a nice outcome. So you fight for a week, but in the end, uh, we were all shaking hands and, and we are happy with the report. Well, if we were to continue under present levels of emissions, then obviously carbon would simply accumulate in the atmosphere. So we would just get warmer and warmer and warmer. If we stopped emissions, on the other hand, then the amount of warming would be sort of nearly constant, at least stopping CO2 emissions would be leading to nearly constant temperatures for a very long time. We're talking about sort of a thousand years, which we often label as irreversibility. So basically saying whatever you have caused and observed is not going to go away on any relevant time scale for humans. Uh, and that implication is, is quite profound, right? It means whatever you have caused is, is there. And it's an interesting aspect that has uh, not con been considered, I think, to sufficiently how you deal with that. Because the economists, they tend to discount the future, um, which is normal. If you have a mobile phone, usually after two years, that has zero value because there's a new one coming out. So you discount the future in some way. Um, and that discounting makes perfectly sense economically. Uh, but if you discount the future costs at sort of a few percent per year, then you end up with a statement that anything beyond 100 years doesn't matter at all, right? So these long-term effects on hundreds and thousands of years, you simply don't care which would imply that you do something and you might do some damage to the world, but you would simply say the next generations will have to live with it or deal with it, right? And the Stern report was one of the first reports to sort of question that argument and say, may, well, maybe for um, sort of environmental resources that discounting is not really appropriate, or at least we shouldn't use a high discount rate if there's a finite resource of, 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 of a natural system, if we're talking about extinction of species, then maybe you shouldn't discount them with 3% per year. If you don't discount them, or at least not as much, then you end up with a very different view of the world because you end up with us doing something that matters for the next 1,000 years. So the question, and this is really a value judgment, it's not a scientific question. The question of how you, how you give value or how, which value you allocate to sort of the present versus the far future, I think is a, is a really interesting one. And the UNFCCC Article 2, I believe, has some language of irreversible climate change. So some of the countries are actually starting to think about how we should consider these long-term effects, things that might actually be happening that we would never be able to get back. Well, first of all, we have to define some sort of target, right? Um, currently, the countries are, have agreed to a two-degree warming relative to pre-industrial, uh, realizing that over the past four days, we have great difficulties in actually defining pre-industrial because uh, the way it's usually defined, 1750, there's actually no data to say how warm it was. Um, but anyway, this is, a, is another issue. Um, you would have to define some sort of target that you say this is something we do not want to exceed. The two degrees can be motivated by climate change impacts, but clearly also there, there is some value judgments of how you aggregate the risks in different regions and different sectors. Um, so there's no scientific proof for two degree. There's also no magic threshold that anything would happen beyond two degree that would be absolutely crazy. But let's take two degrees as a, as a fact because it's been agreed to. Um, then that is a 
again, a scientific question of how much carbon you would be able to emit. And that's what we've done right now. We have basically calculated an emission budget, if you wish. And we come up with a number that is about 800 gigatons of carbon, if you take into account the non-CO2 drivers as well. And of these 800, we have emitted uh, more than 500 already. So we're almost two thirds into that budget. And it's very easy to calculate from current emissions how long you would be able to continue before you've exhausted your budget and you're getting to something like 20, 25 years at current or emissions or current increases of emissions. So clearly that budget that remains is very small. Um, how you allocate it over time is again a policy and economic question. You could either go down quickly and maybe have some, uh, some, some sort of reserves left at the end. Or you can say, well, we'd rather delay things a bit and then go down very quickly. But if you delay, then you're sort of risking that you may actually not be able to speed up your mitigation enough. Um, if you take a sort of a cost effective approach, then the current scenarios would say we would have to peak our emissions in the next few years and we would have to go down by about 50% by mid-century and near zero by the end of the century. If we overshoot that target, so if we go higher transiently, um, that means we would have to go even steeper down later or the alternative, which some scenarios include, we would have to actually go negative, so meaning we would have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at a greater rate than we emit CO2. Well, geoengineering is scientifically really interesting, uh, and it's an emerging field. There's lots of uh, modeling going on, and, and actually there has been sort of a shift in the views of the scientists uh, for many years, that was uh, sort of something that people were really not actually thinking about because they f thought it would be even unethical to run a model in a geoengineering ex experiment because we wouldn't even try to go there. Uh, until uh, basically when Paul Crutzen proposed in a paper that we should actually do the research. So in case that policy wants an answer, we will be in a position to give an answer. And since then, uh, a lot of things have happened and it's, and it's, it's exciting. Um, we know that we could offset the temperature, at least in a global average sense, um, by putting sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere um, or mirrors in, in somewhere between the sun and the earth. Um, but the problem is by doing that, we would change the radiation budget of the Earth considerably. And so we would end up with maybe a lower temperature, but a different pattern of temperature change in high latitudes versus, versus the tropics, and probably a considerable impact on the global water cycle. Now, the problem is that all of these effects are very poorly understood. Um, so the basic conclusion that we found uh, in this last assessment report was that we could probably offset part of the temperature, but the potential side effects could be significant and they, were, they are very uncertain. Now, it's again a policy question of whether that would be an option. Uh, in my personal view, um, it would be unfortunate if we were trying to go there because we actually might, uh, by trying the geoengineering, end up with even more trouble um, than we already have. I'm not sure. At the moment, I would say it's probably a great scientific document uh, where many PhD students will have fun to read and the scientists had fun to produce it. But for policy, I'm honestly not sure what impact it will have because uh, my feeling was until sort of 2009, Copenhagen, there was, a, there was a general view that if we had the facts, if the science was clear, then that would inevitably lead to some sort of global agreement on reducing emissions. Um, and clearly that hasn't happened. So my feeling is that the global climate negotiations are uh, 
today essentially stuck and they're largely disconnected from the science. So honestly, whether we attribute warming to human influence with 90% or 95% or 99%, they're not going to care much. Right? Um, the fact that the climate negotiations don't move forward uh, is because it's, it's about power and it's about money, it's about the economy and it's about interests. Uh, and it's not really about the environment. So despite the fact that the countries have agreed to the two degree, so they all want to go in one direction. In fact, they're going in another direction. Well, to me, there's a fine line actually there. Uh, I would argue that the scientists have a responsibility to explain what they do. They shouldn't go to the politicians like a priest and tell them, you need to do this. Right? I think that would be wrong. Uh, and I see the role of the scientists basically as IPCC is seeing its role. Uh, we should do the assessment. We should pr present the options. And without being prescriptive, um, put the options on the table. But I think we need to be explicit in the language and we need to explain. We cannot just give a number or a few numbers. We need to tell people what these numbers mean without telling them what they need to do. Um, but we need to be quite clear of what these numbers mean so they understand. So uh, in the end, it's the decision of the public um, and the policymakers what they want to do. And I think the scientists have to accept that decision. But I would hope that they take that decision best, based on the best uh, information available. At the moment, I would say I'm not very optimistic, given what has happened over the past few years. And I would probably say there are not many people who are very optimistic. But we have solved other problems. Um, sometimes surprisingly fast. So I wouldn't say it's not possible. Um, if, we, if we did actually agree that we want to solve it, I think it could be solved in principle. Uh, it may take a few more years for people to realize um, what the situation is. Uh, the question is whether it's going to be too late to act or too expensive to act or whether there's still some time to get there. Again, this depends on the target you're setting. Um, if we're talking about the two degree target, uh, we are probably fairly close uh, to the point where you have to say this is not going to work anymore. But it depends also on the amount we're willing to pay, of course. Um, and it depends on sort of the technology we're prepared uh, to use. Right? If, uh, if we say uh, nuclear power is acceptable and carbon sequestration and storage mm -hmm. is also acceptable, then we have probably, even if we wait for 10 more years, we have probably a chance to, to get there. If, however, the public decides that uh, carbon sequestration is not a way forward because there may be potential long-term risks, um, then it's going to be extremely hard to get there. Um, so depending on the, again, choices we make on technology we want to use, um, at some point uh, we will have to say it's getting impossible in a sense that it's impossibly expensive to pay for. Um, and I think we're close to that point. <laughs>